Yep. Okay, everybody, I think we're ready to, uh, to start the evening. Um, I, I, I was just walking in and, and thinking of something to say by, by way of introduction, but I, I often get a chance in introductions like this to, to hold up a cell phone and ask everybody if you could turn it off before the, before the event starts for the obvious reason that it's nice to, to reduce the disruption that it causes. I think in doing it tonight, in a funny way, it actually begins the lecture, or certainly one area of thinking that, that Bill has been thinking through the last few years, um, which is, of course, the relationship between today's newest and often most confusing technologies and their networks and the containment of space and spatial boundaries that we often associate with architecture. Uh, and that's certainly uh, a topic and a focus of to see this image in real size. This recent book that, that Bill has just published the latest of a very long line of, of books that have worked through this relationship between architecture, media, technologies, and particularly communication technologies. <coughs> uh, over the last decade, I think, I think Bill Mitchell's writings have, have consolidated a body of thinking that really does make him one of the world's real visionaries in terms of urban theory and the life of our cities today, and particularly the relationship between those cities and the technologies that are obviously transforming them in, in a great many ways. Uh, Bill was last here uh, about two years ago at the publication of his previous book, a book titled Me++, which is a transliteration of C++ in a programming language, um, which I guess is still popular two years later, but was certainly transforming the way architects were working with the kind of tools they use at the time. <clears throat> His new book, Placing Words, Symbols, Space, in the City, focuses more carefully and in a more sustained way on the ways in which networks and communication technologies uh, aren't just changing cities um, in unexpected ways, but also reinforcing at times in unexpected ways the things that are already occurring within them. That was very much um, the material that was the epilogue of, of Bill Mitchell's previous book. Um, which he ended with a presentation here in the autumn of 2003 by showing uh, a collection of images that went without words at the time, which were really just a collection of the kinds of protests and marches that were occurring around the world in response to the American invasion in Iraq. And I think one of the, the points that he was making about that was that the aggregation of those images across the internet and through that technology was in some way, in a, in a very real sense, transforming and changing the way in which people were occupying the actual spaces of the city. Um, this sustained work and placing words is really an opportunity to work through the various dimensions in which that kind of a phenomena continues to grow uh, in unexpected ways. Um, William Mitchell vis visits us tonight from Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, where he's the academic head of program in media arts and sciences. Uh, and is a professor of architecture, arts, um, media arts and sciences um, at the MIT Media Lab. He's the former dean of the School of Architecture at MIT, uh, where he directs the Smart Cities program, <coughs> uh, and where he works as an ar architectural advisor to one of the United States' most ambitious and sustained building programs on a campus, uh, and he's been involved with many very important building projects that have recently been finished or are still underway there. Um, Bill's write writings go back to the 1970s uh, and early and important pieces that look at everything from the emergence of computer-aided design, solid modeling, and digital tools in the 70s and 80s to increasingly um, the questions about the ways in which those tools are transforming not just the way architects work, but the cities in which we all live. Please join me in welcoming Bill Mitchell. Oh, thank you. It's uh, okay. Make sure we've just got one microphone working here. Um, it, it's terrific to be back here. I all, always enjoy visiting uh, both London and the AA, so it's uh, uh, it's it's fun. 
Uh, I'm going to talk to you this evening uh, about some of the themes that are raised in my new book, Placing Words. Uh, the book generally deals with the flow of information through cities, the, 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 the way that information uh, traverses cities, like, like the blood stream, the blood streaming through a body, if you like, um, flows, uh, sticks in some places, um, accumulates, uh, gets exchanged. Um, and in particular, placing words is concerned with the way in which um, meaning emerges out of the intersection of information flows and place. So, there is a technical dimension to this book, but uh, primarily it's dealing with uh, issues of culture and issues of meaning and uh, bringing together what uh, generally have been fairly separate discourses, the, the discourse of architecture and, and the discourse of digital media. So what I'm going to do is not to summarize the book. I'm hoping you'll actually read the book. Or some of you might be interested in reading the book anyway. What I'd like to do is pick up on uh, some of the themes that I deal with, and in particular illustrate them with some of the recent work from my Smart Cities uh, research group at the MIT Media Lab. So we'll, we'll focus in uh, on some particular things. In particular, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the reinvention of the automobile for the 21st century city. We've been working a lot over the last couple of years in developing a series of concept cars for General Motors that uh, really uh, try to reinvent the automobile as an information device, as a device that uh, not only provides uh, movement in the city, but it provides access to the resources of the city, and that um, really uh, becomes one of the uh, mechanisms for engaging the city in a new way. So I'll give you a little bit of background and then I'll move into talking about that particular project. Let me set a very broad context firstly, and, and this context is a little bit simplistic perhaps, but uh, I find it very useful because it, it enables us to position some of the things that are going on now uh, in, in uh, a way that lends some clarity. You can think of the very long-term evolution of the city as an evolution towards uh, something that behaves more and more like an intelligently coordinated organism. And there are several stages to this. Uh, Pre-industrial cities, you can think of as fundamentally skeleton and skin, um, basically uh, accumulations of material and spatial structures that um, provide shelter, provide protection, and provide intensification of land use through um, multiplication of, of floors vertically and so on. And if you look at the way cities uh, traditionally have been mapped, uh, the, a lot of traditional maps express this view of the city very clearly. So if you look at Nolly's famous map of Rome, what's that, what that's showing is in, indeed the skeleton and the skin, the, 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 um, the kind of solid stuff and the spaces that are created um, in the city. Now if you go to the uh, cities of the industrial era, what you begin to see is cities in acquiring increasingly sophisticated artificial physiologies. So they get all manner of transportation systems. They get um, very sophisticated water supply and waste removal systems. They get multiple energy supply systems. And so cities become traversed by a complexity of networks and um, the processes, the kind of metabolism of the city becomes something that's uh, absolutely fundamental. And a tremendous amount of the attention of urban designers and a tremendous amount of the money in actually building and maintaining cities starts to go into the networks and st starts to go into this physi physiological dimension of it. So cities get mapped in different ways. Uh, a lot of the iconic maps of this era, of the, of, of the uh, era of artificial physiologies, um, show the networks. You're all familiar, of course, with the famous map of the uh, London Underground. I thought I'd show you the analogous thing for Seoul here that uh, is uh, drawn, as you'll see, in exactly the same way, but shows the city um, as a network, shows the, ci the city as a system of flows. Well, now, the third stage is the stage that we're really entering into now. And this is why I want to set the broad historical context. The third stage is a stage in which cities acquire um, artificial nervous systems. These artificial nervous systems consist 
partially of the electronic linkages among different parts of the city, literally the nerves. Um, cities are increasingly densely, densely sensed, so there's, um, they have um, very sophisticated sensory capacity these days. The sensors are attached to a lot of different things, incidentally. You're carrying some sensors around on your body. That phone that was waved around earlier on, of course, is a sensor. It's an audio sensor and it's a video sensor. Um, so there are mobile sensors carried around on our bodies. There are an increasing number of sensors embedded in the physical fabric of the city and indispensable to the functioning of the city. Then there's distributed computation power uh, spread around. Almost everything these days has, um, has chips in it. So an automobile has dozens and dozens and dozens of processors in it, uh, for example. It, it, it's, there's more, um, there's more um, of the cost of a modern automobile in the electrical and electronic systems than in the traditional metal parts of the automobile. Um, so combination of uh, communication links, sensing, processing, and then automatic affecting capability of one kind or another. Uh, devices that can be digitally operated uh, remotely, asynchronously, and so on. So you have to start thinking about mapping cities in different sorts of ways. You want to, uh, to, to begin to understand cities in these terms. You want to do something like this. This little sketch gives some sense of, of for example, Wi-Fi access points, um, the hotspots for Wi-Fi um, overlaid on the city. Now, if you get an overlay of all of these things, the skeleton and the skin, the physiological systems, and then the artificial nervous system laid down on top of this, the artificial nervous system begins to interact with all of the other systems. So, of course, it interacts with transportation, it interacts with energy supply. It starts to create a condition where the, uh, all of the systems of a city can be intelligently coordinated to uh, respond in uh, sophisticated ways to changing conditions and changing needs. I want to show you um, one example of this new kind of mapping of the city, and you can compare this to, you know, to the Nolly map and to the, um, to the famous network maps of, of subway systems. This is a project uh, recently conducted my, by my colleague at MIT, Carlo Ratti. And what Carlo did was got access to the cell phone logs of Milan. So all of the cell phone uh, calls that are made uh, over a typical 24-hour period um, uh, beca became his, uh, his database. And uh, as you probably know, uh, cell phone logs are locationally indexed, so you know where the call is coming from. So what this map shows is uh, the intensity of nervous activity, if you like, electronic activity, of communication activity in the city of Milan at 8 o'clock in the morning. And the colour coding is the red spots, the red areas, are the areas where there's intense activity going on, and the, the blue spots are the areas where there's pretty much nothing going on, and the yellow is a kind of median condition. And you can see, um, you can begin to see, looking at this, the dynamics of the city, the, 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 the way the city is behaving in the 21st century. So early in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning, you see everybody's out in the suburbs. You can see a ring of red around central uh, Milan, and there's nothing going on in the centre of the city at all. Um, it's kind of not a black hole, but a blue hole. Um, almost nothing, almost nothing happening. Then if you take it um, step by step, step at hourly intervals through the day, you can begin to uh, get a very uh, compelling picture of the life of the city. So you go to nine o'clock and uh, people are leaving their homes in the suburbs and they're beginning to uh, commute into the city as you see here. Um, one of the interesting things is there are little angry red spots on a few major traffic intersections. You can probably figure out what's going on there. People are stuck in traffic and, and they're calling to say that they're going to be late or they're making use of the time to uh, transact some business uh, or whatever. But anyway, you can see the activity here has started to move away from the suburb. Uh, suburbs, 10 o'clock, now you start to see um, people are um, at work. So the, the centre of the city is hotting up, some uh, office districts are hotting up, and you see the suburbs are, um, uh, well, it's not the, the activity has moved out of the suburbs. Um, 11 o'clock, um, you begin to see um, you know, a real work pattern um, established. Um, noon, now, uh, probably everybody's out at lunch, so they're walking around in the central city. 
and uh, you see the centre of the city has become um, an intense uh, red area, and the suburbs have, suburbs have all gone blue. And then 1am, um, you can see the exact inverse of the pattern that we saw at 8 o'clock. Now it's the, the centre of the city. Uh, clearly it's lunch hour. Everybody's out making cell phone calls, and uh, well, you see, see this kind of pattern. So we're beginning to see, we're beginning to be able to see something of the dynamics of the city that has an electronic nervous system. And um, we're beginning, there's a lot of interest around my uh, shop at the moment in finding different ways to represent and map this uh, new condition in the city, this, this city that's starting to behave as an organism um, with a nervous system. Now you see the same sort of thing at an architectural scale, so you can make exactly the same sort of analysis. So pre-industrial buildings are fundamentally skeleton and skin. This is Logier's famous plate, of course, uh, explaining that idea. So you see the skeleton very, very clearly here. Um, there are no mechanical systems in this thing. There are, you know, none of that kind of stuff. It, it's uh, absolutely architecture as um, skeleton and skin. That's where the design attention went. That's where the, um, that's where the money went. Um, here's a little um, uh, example of... Uh, this, is, this happens to be in Queensland, Australia. This is in the Queensland Botanical Gardens, and I've always loved this because this is the exact um, sort of translation of Logier's diagram um, into the Australian tropics. And once again, you see the skeleton and skin, very simple skeleton, and then a very simple skin system on the roof to keep the uh, tropical rain away from you. Then, of course, as you all know, moving through the 19th century and into the 20th century, uh, the mechanical and electrical systems and, and the internal transportation systems of buildings uh, became increasingly dominant. And so buildings acquired these artificial physiologies, and you see projects like, uh, like the Pompidou. Uh, and now we move on to um, a condition at an architectural scale where buildings acquire uh, artificial nervous systems. This is a project that's currently in operation at the MIT Media Lab. Well, it's actually in Cambridge, uh, um, near, near the Media Lab. This is a project by Kent Larson uh, called Place Lab. And this is a little apartment, just a standard little speculative developer apartment that has been um, outfitted as a densely sensed environment. So the plan that you see in the middle here shows all of the different sensors that are embedded in this environment. Um, you can see over in the bottom corner here what these sensors look like. They're, they're little, wireless, uh, little wireless devices that cost practically nothing and you can just Velcro them to things so you can deploy these sensors everywhere. And they're different kinds of sensors. It's a multi-sensory kind of thing. So there are pressure sensors that detect where people walk. There are accelerometers in doors and in appliances so you know when you open the refrigerated door and uh, things like this. There are audio sensors, not recording people's speech incidentally, but recording levels of um, ambient sound. Um, there are light sensors, there are heat sensors, there are sensors for bodily presence. So this thing um, generates an immense stream of data, very, um, very fine resolution data that um, monitors in great detail what's going on in this space. Uh, then the software that's associated with this does sensor integration. So it takes this, this enormous data stream and it interprets it using a process that's very much like speech recognition or character recognition in computer science uh, to do behavior recognition. So the apartment knows when you're making a cup of tea, the apartment knows when you're folding the laundry, the, the apartment knows all of the activities that go on inside for good or ill. So it understands um, at that level of abstraction, at the level of behavior, rather than simply the level of, um, sens of, of sensor signals, uh, what's happening. So why would you want to do this? Why would you want to make a building like this? Well, there are, there are two reasons. One is, um, as an experimental environment to investigate these questions of how do you do the sensor integration and, and uh, how do you make it all work and, and uh, all of these kinds of things. And another aspect of the experimental dimension of this is that uh, it provides an amazing environment for actually understanding what the fine-grained behavior patterns are in space over time. So you, 
um, we get people to live here for, um, for a few weeks and uh, you really begin to track and understand uh, actually how they use the space and there, there are some uh, astonishing um, results come out of that. But the longer term thing, beyond the immediate experimental thing, is that you can begin to develop new kinds of functionality. So one of the uh, functions that, that Kent Larson and his group have been looking at the functions of um, distributed health care for the ageing baby boomers. Uh, it's clearly going to be impossible to provide effective health care uh, for the ageing baby boomers using traditional structures of nursing homes and hospitals and so on. And uh, of course that has lots of social disadvantages too. It takes people out of the community and, and so on. So um, what might you do if you had an intelligent environment? Well, this environment knows if you're in trouble. It knows if you fall down. Um, it knows if you're moving in a way that um, indicates that you're ill, that you need attention, that you need help, and so on. That's one level of it. It knows if you're taking your medication, um, and it will give you subtle little hints that you better take those pills. Um, and uh, uh, it knows some more subtle things. It knows if you're eating right. So maybe it puts a message on the refrigerator door and suggests to you uh, what you might want to have to lunch in order to maintain the right kind of dietary regime. It knows if you're getting sufficient exercise. So it might make some suggestions about this and so on. So the idea of this is to be able to um, provide an effective well being environment um, that uh, does not displace uh, people out of the community. Of course, it raises all sorts of other very interesting questions about privacy and, and uh, just uh, how you, who, who you want to know. For example, just to digress for a moment, let, let's say um, the apartment um, does discover that you're um, not doing too well. So it's one thing if it tells you, if it's a reflexive kind of thing where it feeds that information back to you. Now, do you tell the kids if grandma is uh, not feeling well? You know, may maybe you do that. Um, do you tell the insurance company? Um, maybe you don't do that, um, I'd suggest. Um, so, so there are some very interesting questions begin to arise um, when you make these aware environments. That th the price of intelligence is awareness. So that uh, by, if, if you create an environment that's able to provide these sophisticated kinds of functionality by having awareness, processing power, um, an electronic nervous system, you've also got to uh, start looking at the ethics of the way these environments uh, behave. So that's, that's, that's coming down to an architectural scale now of um, going from skeleton and skin to skeleton and skin plus physiology, which is the kind of thing that was explored right, right through the 20th century, to skeleton and skin plus physiology plus um, electronic nervous system, overlaid on top of all of that. So the building becomes much more like a creature. Now, I'm going to spend the rest of the time within this context talking about a recent project we've been looking at uh, to uh, uh, rethink the automobile within this kind of framework. So think of the, uh, again, let's, let's use this same kind of framework of going from skeleton and skin to physiology to electronic nervous system. Um, an early carriage, a simple carriage that you might drag behind a horse um, was skeleton and skin. There wasn't anything much else in it. An automobile, a gasoline-powered automobile, is an amazingly complex uh, metabolic system that sucks in fuel and oxygen and spews stuff out into the atmosphere and so on. If you take an automobile apart, um, you see it has this kind of... Yeah, internal metabolism that involves electrical systems and flows of fuel and flows of air and flows of water um, and so on. Uh, then the next stage is, again, if you overlay on top of this, um, a great deal more intelligence. A combination of intelligence and miniaturization, in, fa in fact. So the project we've been pursuing for the last couple of years, it's a project that involves my group at the Media Lab uh, Frank Gehry's office in Los Angeles and General Motors. Um, so it's a geographically distributed project, firstly, and it's a multidisciplinary project. We set this project up um, in a kind of framework that's very much like that of a theatrical ensemble. So we have uh, people who have specialised skill in different areas but their roles are not rigidly defined and there's no rigid hierarchy in the way that this project works. Uh, anybody is free to make a comment on any aspect of what's happening. 
uh, the responsibility of everybody in the group is to educate the other people in the group about their particular areas of specialization. So we build up a group competence and group intellectual capital. And um, the group is very multidisciplinary. It, it involves um, architects, urban designers, mechanical engineers, um, uh, electrical engineers and computer scientists. We have uh, a medical doctor uh, on the project. Uh, it's, it's a whole mixture. Then the, uh, the, the, the um, it's also cross-generational, so it goes all the way from uh, senior researchers down to the most junior undergraduates who are fantastic co contributors. MIT undergraduates can do just about anything, so it's wonderful to have them as, as part of the team. Uh, the way it's set up is, is, is fairly interesting, I think. We, we've set it up within the framework of what, what I like to call a design laboratory, which I think of as a, a generalization of the traditional idea of the architectural atelier or the architectural um, studio. So it assumes that in order to get the talent pool that you need to work on a complex project like this, you're not going to be able to co-locate all of them all the time. It's going to be a geographically distributed talent pool that you want to work with, and they're going to have complicated schedules, and they're going to travel, and they're going to do uh, things like this. So you need a framework for enabling that kind of complicated group to work together. So we set it up in this kind of way. We, we uh, look at it and we say, well, uh, the kinds of interactions that we need to support to do this sort of work, uh, firstly, can be divided between uh, local and remote interactions. Local interactions, what we're doing right now, of course, remote interactions where you introduce some sort of electronic technology to enable communication at a distance. And then the other basic distinction is between synchronous and asynchronous communication. Uh, synchronous, no time delays. Asynchronous, there's some storage in the system somewhere and um, time delays happen. And I've taken the position that uh, the kind of environment we need to do uh, to uh, perform this kind of project, to, to pursue this sort of project effectively, has to fill in all of the cells in this box. So um, local synchronous interaction, that's the face-to-face -face studio environment that we all know and love and, and that has a tremendous, uh, a tremendous intensity, um, vitality to it. Um, uh, also hands-on shop work. There's a lot of the work that you do in a project like this that, that requires you to be right there in the shop building things and that's a very much a local activity. Then um, introduce a remote synchronous communication. So, Things like Skype, for example. I, I've been amazed over the last year how um, uh, in the studio environment, uh, Skype is just on all the time and there are interactions going on remotely with all kinds of people. It's not like telephones, not like traditional telephony. It can, um, because it doesn't cost anything, it's just left on all the time and it creates a kind of interconnection of uh, remote collaborators that's very, very different from traditional forms. Then there are familiar things of teleconferencing and video conferencing, uh, remote CAD model sharing and so on. All of this is, is fundamental to it. Then, um, of course, remote asynchronous communication, things like email, um, websites. We have a working environment, an electronic working environment called Studio MIT, which is kind of like a complex blog where everything that's done by the group gets uh, recorded in this online environment. So, text objects, um, uh, images, uh, digital models, 3D digital models, it all becomes available through Studio MIT. So any pa anybody um, from anywhere in the world at any time can get access to the accumulating intellectual property of the group. And then, of course, there's um, asynchronous local um, interaction where you have you build prototypes and models and things like this that are really not very transportable. Uh, you leave them in a place where they can be referred to. And so um, somebody puts them there and, and uh, some weeks later somebody may come in and look at them and begin to develop it uh, and so on. So all of these things have to work together. That's the kind of environment we've been doing this project um, within. So let me tell you a little bit about um, the, uh, uh, where we've got to on this. Um, one of the first things we came to was an understanding that if you want to reinvent the automobile, you have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, you literally have to reinvent the wheel. And one of the most basic things that you'll see in this project is the idea of a, a digitally controlled wheel robot. The 
idea of this is you can take the space of the wheel, standard space of a wheel of an automobile, and you can put just about everything that's mechanically important in the wheel itself. So you can put propulsion in the wheel itself. This has a great advantage. This gets rid of engines and, and powertrains and all of that kind of stuff. So put propulsion in the wheel. Um, secondly, you can put steering in the wheel. Um, thirdly, you can put braking in the wheel. These things are often in the wheel anyway. If you put all of that stuff in the wheel, then you can make an object that has a simple snap-on connection to the chassis of an automobile, and you just have a power cable and a data cable going into it and nothing else. Once you do that, that opens up enormous freedom in the design of the automobile. And you can begin to address uh, a tremendous number of questions that are impossible to address within the framework of traditional automobile architecture. So um, let me show you a little bit about these wheel robots. Um, this is the first um, semi-functional prototype. So just one wheel, um, a little trailing wheel so we can we can drive it around. Now, the process on this was to uh, develop the idea, um, do CATIA models of the, uh, do CATIA models of the, um, of, of the idea. Oh, here it's being photoshopped onto some traditional automobiles. So you do CATIA models, then you do these semi-functional models out of plexiglass that are, that are done with a, a uh, water jet cutter and milling machines directly from the CAD model. And, and we do it ourselves. We don't send it out to a fabrication shop. Um, and then when you think you've got, um, you've got the whole thing um, uh, pretty much right, then you can use the same digital model to go directly to cutting metal with a water jet cutter and with milling machines and so on. So you can see that, uh, that whole process here. Um, CAD model, rendered CAD model, then there's some paper and cardboard models, which are not shown here, generated from this. Then the semi-functional model, which is done in plexiglass, which is quick, quick and cheap and easy and more or less functions mechanically, but obviously wouldn't do it for a long time. And then you have the cut metal in the, um, in the frame at the end. So um, we worked on this prototype, uh, developed it, and what I'll show you next is um, a, a fully functional prototype. No steering yet, and it has no brakes either. So it's, it's <laughs> um, even around the media lab outside here, but you can see it works mechanically. <laughs> very convincing demonstration of this idea of the wheel robot. And we ran this past General Motors engineers, and the General Motors engineers said things like, well, if that was a good idea, we would have done it 20 years ago. <laughs> and, and, and then they thought some more and said, ah, actually, it's not such a bad idea after all. And then they said, well, yes, OK, now let, let's get down to what are the real engineering problems. Like you put tremendous stress on bearings, in, and so we talked to the bearings engineers and so on. So, so by laying out this kind of prototype, uh, you're able to tap into a vast richness of engineering knowledge that's out there, um, in fact, which always starts out being very negative, but then uh, you harness it into the project. And, and uh, so we, we have everybody thoroughly convinced at this point that wheel robots work. Um, now, what can you do with these wheel robots? Here's, here's an early conceptual sketch showing the sort of omnidirectional motion that you can get. Now, this, 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 this guy's going to park. So you just rotate the wheels, rotate the cabin, and uh, just drive. So this has a very small footprint. Um, it's mechanically pretty easy to do. And you begin to see what you can uh, do with these things. Now, um, another implication of, of all of this that you're probably beginning to think about is, firstly, the control system on this is fiendishly complicated. But we can do it now. This is, this, this is the sort of thing. We can get the su sufficiently sophisticated nervous system into this thing so it really works. So, so think of all of these wheels as independent little robots, just like having four horses, right? Um, uh, imagine a horse on each, each corner. Um, so we're putting the horse back in the horseless carriage is one way to think about this, except it's a sophisticated, high-tech, 21st century horse, and it's electronically controlled rather than being controlled by reins. So you have to coordinate the motion of these uh, independent wheels, but 
when you can do that, um, you know, the thing can do crabwise motion, it can turn 90 degrees, it can spin on its own axis, it can do all sorts of fantastic maneuvers that are really, really interesting. So we got very excited about this. Um, and you can start to see that it, it's looking more like an electronic thing, uh, an intelligent electronic thing, than a big heavy metal um, mechanical thing. One of the other things that um, is implied by this, so you can't quite see it terribly clearly here, is that um, we really wanted to get rid of steering wheels. We want to get rid of engines, we want to get rid of drivetrains, uh, we really want to get rid of steering wheels as well, because they're dangerous, they're obstructive, um, they're a remnant from the days of steering ships, you know, the captain steering the ship and so on. There are better ways to do it now. Once you go to fly-by-wire or drive-by-wire, uh, to electronic control. It opens up the possibility of drive with a joystick or um, drive with um, the arms of the, um, of the seat and all kinds of things that, that uh, are very interesting. And I'll come back to that um, later on. Here's the next prototype. Okay, so we got to, uh, got to that point. Now, um, what I'll show you is um, a little bit more developed concept how you can, of, of how you can take the idea of the uh, omnidirectional um, uh, smart wheel and um, combine it with some new thoughts about how you make um, passenger cabins and uh, rethink the footprint of the automobile in the city and the behavior of the automobile in the city. This is a little car that um, works like a shopping cart, like an, airport, uh, like an airport luggage cart or a shopping cart. These little cars stack. The little electric cars, they stack. Um, they're shared use cars. So the basic idea is that you, um, uh, you just pick one off the front of a stack, like you pick up um, a, a luggage cart at the airport. You swipe your credit card, so now you've, you know you've got this thing. You probably don't swipe your credit card. You probably use your mobile phone or something like that. But you electronically identify yourself anyway. And uh, you drive it away. And then when you finish with it, you just put it in the back of a stack somewhere else. And these things recharge while they're in the stack, while they're going through the stack. This overcomes one of the fundamental problems of electric cars. Uh, electric cars mostly don't work because the power den density of batteries is no good. Um, so you either have to very limited range or you have a situation where you're carrying around an enormous uh, quantity of batteries. But if you set up a system where every time the car stops it's being recharged, then um, you overcome that range, um, uh, range ceases to matter. So I'll give you a little animation showing uh, uh, two of our students here who are, are um, uh, posing with the car right here. Uh, I'll show you how this works. Don't take this too literally. The car does actually have doors and things. This is just a, a diagrammatic prototype. And it folds up on its hind legs, as you'll see in a moment. This gives it a tiny footprint in the city. And then it stacks. So the next one comes along like a luggage cart. And you see how it goes. So this is a lot smaller than a smart car in the footprint that it occupies in the city. A lot smaller. All right, now we'll see somebody coming and picking uh, one off the front of the stack. See? And these things know who you are, so um, they personalize to the, uh, the way you want it. So the color um, adapts to your color preference. The seats all adjust and so on. So. pulls the stack forward and drives away. And if you're curious about how the animation was done, that's how it was done. <laughs> so, 
All right, let me um, now take you forward a little bit from there. So, so um, based on my, these ideas, uh, we've developed an enormous number of variants on the idea of a, a little stacking city car. And, and here are some of them. Some of these make sense, some of them don't. Um, some of them are. Um, a, a wonderful little thing, some of them are quite ugly, but you can think of what, 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 what this begins to show you is that once you fundamentally rethink the architecture of the automobile, one, once you um, say we're not going to structure an automobile in the traditional way, but we're going to reorganize it fundamentally to take advantage of uh, the possibility of smart components, then a huge range of different sorts of options um, open up. Here's another one. This is just very crudely diagrammatic, but um, it uh, begins to show you uh, some of the other possibilities. This is a little triangular one with omnidirectional wheels. So this thing has um, amazing uh, motions. It can do all sorts of strange things. And um, it, it, uh, to park, you just, um, these things just click together like uh, molecules in a crystallographic lattice. So they close pack, they're triangles, and so you get a close pack grid. And uh, because they're all um, electronically controlled and can be remotely controlled, um, you can get cars out of the middle of one of these crystals. All you have to do is command all the cars to uh, open up a slippage plane, and then you just drive the one out of the middle, and they close up again. <coughs> so uh, you can get completely close-packed parking out of this kind of thing. So this is another example. When you put some intelligence into very familiar objects, they can begin, begin to do some uh, unexpected things. So think of the, think of the, the, the way you can begin to uh, transform parking when you put together the idea of the stack or the crystalline parking uh, that we're seeing here. Um, this is, uh, let, me get, let me get back here. This is um, one more um, early conceptual sketch that, that um, illustrates a couple of other ideas. Again, don't take this too literally. Um, one, one, one of the things we pursued is, is the notion that sheet metal is really a bad idea, a very, very bad idea. Um, it's environmentally bad to um, spray press and spray paint enormous quantities of sheet metal, and it just doesn't perform. It rusts. Um, it, you, 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 when you bang up against other cars, it dings. Um, it, it's not a tremendously effective um, um, impact-resistant uh, Im impact. Um, uh, resisting uh, device. So we developed a whole range of concepts that um, work with having an exoskeleton and a soft body that's built like a sneaker. Sneaker manufacturers turn, to, turn out to know a tremendous amount about making uh, amazingly sophisticated structures out of pretty soft stuff. And so if you imagine the body of a car being made like a sneaker, you see that, all that, that quilted stuff there, and uh, an exoskeleton, and then Impact resistance and safety is done not in the way that traditional automobiles do. Traditional automobile, you have a crumple zone, and then you have a seat belt, and you have an airbag, and none of these systems work terribly well, but you hope all of them working together are going to save you when you run into an SUV or something like that. Now, think of the way a baseball catcher or, or, or a cricket wicketkeeper um, catches a little hard ball going at about 100 miles an hour. Now, the way they do it is by intelligent impact, impact absorption, intelligent energy absorption, right? You, 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 uh, you catch the ball. I used to be a slips fieldsman, right? So you do it with your bare hands, right? You, you, you uh, catch the ball and you move your hand back. You all know this. And, and you, uh, you dissipate the energy in that fashion. That, again, is something you can do when you put some intelligence in the system. Um, you also need to be able to... Uh, you know, have some room for motion. You can't do that if your hand's up against a brick wall. It'll be extremely painful if you try to catch a cricket ball in that sort of situation. Um, anyway, so that, that's what's illustrated by this concept. What this one illustrates is an idea that I kind of liked. We never took it any further. It has a hook on top, and you could hook these ones up to park them like the dry cleaning or like uh, carcasses in a butcher's shop. Uh, we thought that was nice, but probably not really a practical thing in the end. <laughs> And the 
to see how the articulation begins to work. Of course, this has tremendous advantages and stability and so on. Again, you need intelligence to do it because it's like an athlete now. The thing has to be coordinated. The athlete is going to be You can steer um, a surfboard, no hands. So why not steer an automobile, no hands? So this is the um, idea of um, what we call the athlete car. And the athlete car is a car that's designed to get the maximum amount of thrill out of the minimum amount of energy. So unlike traditional um, sports cars, where you make a 450 horsepower engine and you put it in an incredibly expensive body and you burn a huge amount of energy and make a gigantic amount of noise, um, these cars are designed to be um, elegant, athletic, um, highly coordinated, very much tied to the bodily experience of driving, so you're not sort of strapped into a you know, rigid cockpit. Um, and actually, they probably don't, they don't have to go all that fast in order to be really thrilling. That's the basic idea of the athlete car. Um, when you've defined that concept, uh, you can begin to make these things into wonderful objects. So uh, here's one of the, the versions of the athlete car. This is the, this is the sort of macho Californian, you know, muscle flexing um, um, car from hell. Um, and uh, you, you, can, uh, you can imagine the thrill for certain people driving this one. Um, here's a different version. This is kind of um, styled up like a, a hockey player or a football quarterback. Um, it has a different kind of, kind of feel to it. Um, and there are a whole bunch of these. Um, we've got lots and lots and lots of these. The, 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 because, the, um, because you've got the um, articulated body to work with, and because uh, you don't have standard engines or any of that stuff, it's all in the wheels, there's um, tremendous freedom opened up to develop, develop these ideas. Um, so let me, I'm, I'm going to wrap up with, with the one that we're building right now. We, we, we decided that we, uh, in order to test out the athlete concept, we needed to build one. And so we designed a um, mini one that's absolutely stripped down to one wheel, as you see here, and you balance on top of the wheel. Um, so there's the wheel, it's a kind of little outrigger. So in, in many ways, it's a, it's a little bit like a tricycle. Um, the um, seat balance is on top, and uh, it is no hands driving. So the, the seat senses your motions. The seat is filled with sensors. And uh, as, you, as you move your body, the uh, wheel responds, both in steering and acceleration and in camber and, and all of these kinds of things. And um, you drive around uh, no hands. So that's, the early, that's one of the very early um, CAD sketches. This is um, a non-functional um, paper and foam core model just done um, from the, um, cut from the um, same digital model. So you can see that you can begin to see how this works now. The, this is again the motor wheel. Uh, the batteries live in these outriggers here, and you can see the seat now. The, the, the seat design is, is, is much further developed at this point. So it's a flexible seat, and it um, has sensors in the joints of this seat, and it's very carefully anatomically constructed. So it, it's very very sophisticated sensor of bodily motion. And uh, we're fabricating this right now. So uh, the, the design has uh, obviously uh, evolved to something much more sophisticated than this uh, simple model would suggest. But the basic concept is exactly the same. Uh, we're doing it in carbon fiber. And um, in, in about two weeks, we should have um, a running prototype. So if you come and visit us, um, after we've put a couple of test pilots in this thing, um, you'll probably be able to um, you'll probably be able to ride it. Um, <laughs> one of the um, it, 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 it probably does require you to be uh, pretty athletic, which is probably which really is the whole point of this thing. So probably we're going to put a gymnast in here first. Um, of course, 
the other advantage of putting a gymnast in there is if the thing stops suddenly, it sort of pitches you out, the gymnast can stick their landing, and <laughs> it can be, it can be uh, quite a bit of fun. So that's where we are. Um, we're continuing to explore these concepts uh, exactly as I showed you the city evolving from uh, skeleton and skin through physiological systems to intelligent organism. Uh, and exactly as I showed you very briefly, buildings evolving in that direction. Uh, we've been taking uh, automobiles and uh, applying the same philosophy to it. It's something that only has become possible in um, very recent times through inexpensive computation, miniaturized electronics, um, sensors that you can put everywhere, um, electric motors that are miniaturized, uh, battery technology that's reasonably good, and so on. But if you really follow through the implications of these new technological conditions, you begin to be able to fundamentally rethink a familiar object and uh, give it new functionality and uh, new cultural properties and new formal expression. And I'd like to suggest to you that this um, mode of rethinking the familiar in the context of a 21st century technology is something that's of fundamental importance at architectural scale, at urban scale, at the scale of automobiles, and indeed I'd argue right down at the nano scale. So that's it. If you want to uh, hear more about it, uh, there are several books I've done over the last decade, and you can look up on the, uh, the Media Lab site and uh, see more of what we've been doing. So thank you. Good. There we go. Thanks, Bill. Thanks very much. Should we take a few questions? I'll, I'll let them uh, formulate one or two and yeah. just ask. I think one of the things yeah. that comes up in the, in the presentation today, and certainly it stands yeah. out yeah. without comment, I thought maybe you, you could say something about um, two features seem, mm. seem paramount. The first is the role of prototyping yep. Yep. As, a, as a kind of engine that drives something yep. to a next stage. Yep. Um, uh, and the second one, of course, which seems a special feature, particularly being at the Media Lab, the yep. question of multidisciplinarity yep. Yep. and how the different disciplines themselves talk, which f yep. for a place like us named after one particular discipline, of course, yep. poses interesting challenges on its own. Yeah, they're both very interesting <coughs> questions. The, the, the prototyping question is extremely interesting. I, I hope I emphasized that a little bit as we went through it, that, that this process of going from digital modeling to non-functional physical prototype to semi-functional <laughs> physical prototype to fully functional physical prototype and moving back and forth and, and learning from all of these different um, kinds of representations of the final object is absolutely fundamentally important. And uh, uh, what we've tried to do is to create an environment where we can do all of that um, in our own facility and you do it very, very quickly. So you can go literally in a day from doing the, um, the CAD model to, to cutting metal. And this is absolutely fundamental because um, the, 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 the kind of learning process that you need to do in order to, to do this kind of uh, uh, technologically innovative design absolutely depends on, on being able to get, you know, fast cycling. Fast cycling is really, really, really critical in this. And you've got to get your hands on the physical stuff. And you've got to uh, do things like actually build the control systems and so on. I mean, one of the things I haven't talked about, because there's not really the, 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 the kind of group to talk about it in, that, that all of these things have amazingly sophisticated control systems in them. So you have to prototype those. And uh, MIT undergraduates can do this. They're an amazing <laughs> labor force to be able to, to do this kind of thing. So what we've tried to do is to pull together the uh, kind of multidisciplinary environment so we really can move very quickly by actually building things. This, this is absolutely fundamental. I mean, you could talk all you want about the motor wheel, about the robotic wheel, but in the end you've got to build it. And then the first one doesn't work and then you've got to be able to cycle through it and, and that kind of thing. Um, we are going to do a big... Um, big sort of grand traditional build with General Motors, probably next summer where we'll take one of these concepts and, you know, their shop will build, um, build a couple of big ones and take it to the auto shows and that kind of thing. But the, these quick rough prototypes are enormously valuable and I think that's something that can be generalised to, uh, to other contexts. Um, 
then the multidisciplinarity is a really critical thing. I, I've, I must say for um, decades now, I've chafed at the limitations of traditional disciplinary boundaries in design and, and uh, you know, I've chafed at it from, from you know, from position of being a dean and from being a department head in architecture schools and so on. And, you know, there are just a lot of problems you can't address uh, within the framework of very narrow um, disciplinary definitions. Or you get into fruitless arguments like, is this architecture? Right? Or, is it not architecture? And so what I've wanted to do is, is create uh, an environment that, that is radically cross-disciplinary and um, addresses serious design problems and, and uh, engages architects and architects' ways of thinking and the kind of cultural sensitivities that architects um, bring to these kinds of projects, but to broaden the disciplinary base and not to do it within the framework that uh, architectural practice usually organises it by engaging a whole series of you know, professional consultants in, in different uh, specialised areas, because that doesn't get the intimacy of collaboration and, and the, the kind of um, uh, spontaneous uh, um, sort of serendipitous generation of ideas that you really want. So the theatrical ensemble metaphor is something I, I pushed very, very hard in this, where we try and build a group that is committed to the project of the group, um, that uh, people have their individual talents and specialisations and we try to be very careful about um, credits and acknowledgement uh, and so on. But the fundamental thing is to build up um, competence within the group very, very quickly. Th there are techniques for this too that, that um, again are opened up by the digital environment. Um, whenever we have a brainstorming session, everybody has uh, their wireless laptops, and if some idea comes up, of course, somebody immediately Googles the idea, right? and, and, and so you, you accumulate um, expertise very, very quickly in this kind of environment. So it, it is a new way of working. It, it's, it's not the way automobile design gets done. Um, it's not the way that uh, architecture normally gets done, and it is... Um, Fundamental to it is the um, ensemble method of interdisciplinary work, uh, the direct hands-on, you know, so this is a blue-collar thing, not a white-collar thing, right? We have our hands, it, it's a workshop, not, a, um, not an information processing uh, place in some, some um, uh, kind of sanitised way. Um, and the um, kind of non-hierarchical character of it's absolutely <laughs> fundamental. Um, so you can't organise these things as a, as a pyramid. I, I, you, you really have to uh, uh, open up the possibility of the lowliest undergraduate making a, a creative contribution, which they then, then go and proceed to do um, brilliantly. So that's the, that's the kind of framework. Thank you. Um, questions? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I really like the idea. I really like the idea you were just talking about uh, in relation to the blue collar, yeah. you know, the collaborative side of it. Yeah. Having started out as a carpenter myself and gone into architecture later, mm -hmm. that means yeah. a lot to me. But yeah. I, I have a question um, regarding there seems to be kind of an approach to design, like yeah. trying to remove a cause and effect when <laughs> you do things yeah. like, for instance, the uh, approach to the to the steering wheel. You, yeah. you, you didn't want to have yeah. A direct steering wheel, you wanted to have a, a kind of a mouse computer. Yeah, not a not, mouse. Not, not, not a quite yeah. hand eye yeah. coordination, yeah. exactly. But yeah. And then with the body, you yeah. had the body that was kind of yeah. in a bicycle. It wasn't quite a bike, but yeah. you know, it yeah. looked like a bike, it wasn't a bike. Yeah. What, what was, the, <coughs> what was the, the point behind that, really? Well, the, the fundamental point is, is that, you know, take an artifact like an automobile, it's been around for a hundred years, um, there's a tremendous amount of domain expertise about designing these things, um, but it's settled, the whole field is settled into a kind of process of incremental modification, right, which they do brilliantly actually, I, I, I have enormous respect for the people who, you know, refine and modify and, and um, in incrementally transform an automobile, but if you want to um, open up some fundamentally new possibilities, like a really tiny footprint in the city, <laughs> like an electric car that really works, like, like a new driving experience that's much more bodily, um, like new ways of relating to safety. You have to challenge the fundamental architecture, the, you know, the fundamental um, organisation of parts and hierarchy of elements and so on. And the way to do that is, is to critically focus on um, 
assumptions that everybody takes as, a, as just given and unchallengeable and see if you can rock them, see if you can you know, rock them and shock them and, 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 uh, and break them down. So um, getting rid of the engine, you know, sounds like a crazy idea, but in fact turned out to be a very powerful idea um, by, by distributing, miniaturizing, distributing, put in the wheels, uh, getting rid of sheet metal, um, getting rid of um, getting rid of the steering wheel. These are these are not gratuitous things, but, but they're really aimed at opening up a you know new design space that you can begin to um, you can begin to work in. Um, and then the ultimate goal, well let, let me just digress on the city car. The, the, the ultimate goal of the city car that I showed you is uh, an integrated personal transportation system where you have these very efficient, non-polluting, silent, small footprint little city cars. You put them, you, you, you work them in collaboration with mass rapid transit, particularly bus and bus rapid transit. And so when you get off the bus, you immediately pick up one of these guys and, and drive off to where you need to go. And you integrate that also with um, uh, distributed electrical system. So imagine an electrical grid where all of the houses have solar, um, all of the houses uh, may, may, maybe have a fuel cell and so on. So you get a distributed system instead of a traditional centralised electrical system. Um, that also depends on intelligence, by the way, on having very, very intelligent control. The cars throw a lot of battery capacity into the grid, so things like solar become a lot more um, effective because they can suck up the solar power when the, the sun is out. Um, put all of this together as an integrated intelligent system. Um, you just got to have a different kind of vehicle than, than a traditional automobile to make that kind of integrated intelligent system work. So you've got to look for these, I think, points of vulnerability, these kind of ossified assumptions ab about um, design of particular kind of artifacts, and see if you can blow them away. Now, sometimes it turns out to be crazy. Sometimes you try and blow one away, and of course it turns out that it's there for a very good reason. But every now and again you succeed, and, and that's what we've been trying to do. Should we take yep. it? Bill, can you tell us what the role of uh, Frank Gehry's office is in the City Car Project? Well, we, uh, we started out, Frank, Frank and I, it started out from conversations Frank and I had over the years where we'd, we'd sort of moan to each other about how urban designers always had to take the automobile as given and then you had to work around, you know, the, this, uh, this artifact that was just given to you and you had to design, uh, you know, had to design buildings to accommodate and had to design systems to accommodate them. So we, um, uh, we've tried to promote a project and eventually succeeded in promoting a project where um, we reversed it and said, okay, given a conception of what we want 21st century city to look like, to be like, to function like, then what should the automobile be like within the framework of that? So that was the genesis. Um, we, we, went to, we all went to driving, race car driving school together um, <laughs> to kick the project off, including Frank and, uh, um, and, and sort of incredibly dangerously drove race cars around to learn about vehicle dynamics, um, <laughs> which we knew nothing about um, when we started out on this. And then, um, particularly in the early stages of the project, um, there was a lot of uh, sort of discussion back and forth, um, joint brainstorming sessions and that kind of thing. Jim Glimp, particularly uh, at Frank's office, major, major um, role in this. Um, we may, when, when we go to do the um, full-scale build of, of a kind of final product on this, we, we may go back to a much closer collaboration again to go through design development and all of that kind of process because we don't have that sort of capacity. So it's, been a, it's been a very fruitful um, kind of um, ideas collaboration that, that sometimes has been very intense and other times has been not particularly intense. So. I mean, ob obviously they, they don't contribute much to the mechanical engineering. They don't know about ball bearings and stuff like that. One um, yeah. Yeah. imagines that the, uh, the major thrust of the, yeah. de the design yeah. of these um, concepts is uh, <coughs> media arts and sciences yeah. Yeah. In, the, in the master program yeah. and also the doctoral program. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one expects that the undergraduate research opportunities yeah. program yes. has yeah. a significant role yeah. also, yes. which opens up the interdisciplinarity. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I mean, one, one of the particular things about MIT, I probably should explain to the larger group, is um, uh, M M MIT has a program where um, undergraduates um, 
can get a big chunk of their academic credit or they can be paid for working directly on research projects. They can become members of research teams. And, and they're, you know, they're not the low-level low sort of um, slave labour. They're really, um, really, you know, real, fully functional members of the teams. So um, there are thousands of them. It's an astounding talent pool. They can do all kinds of things. So um, one of the things you do when you're trying to do a project like this is just put the word out on the Europe network that you need a, you need a control system or you need um, some machining or you need some welding. Um, I needed welders this last summer and, and got a team of undergraduate women, actually. They're fabulous, they're absolutely <laughs> fabulous welders. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a talent pool that, that um, really can be focused on these projects and, and they're amazing contributors. And that's one of the reasons um, we, we decided that uh, we, we had thought when we started out this project we'd, we'd, that we'd need to make a lot of use of professional fabrication shops and so on. And as soon as we got into it, we looked around and said, well, we have the, you know, the technical talent and we have the equipment to do it ourselves, so why do we need these people? And, and so let, let's you know, really shorten the loop and bring it all in-house and get into this experimental fabrication kind of thing, which is a little bit different from you know, the kind of experimental fabrications happened a lot in architecture in the last few years because th these are mechanical and electronic devices as well, so the kind of levels of sophisticated functionality that you know, sometimes exist in buildings but, but don't always exist in buildings. So yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it, this kind of project very much um, both depends on those undergraduate research opportunities and of course gives enormous um, fun and educational opportunity to the undergraduates too. Yeah. Hi, Bill. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's yeah. clearly a technological innovation that you show yeah. us today, yeah. but yeah. I was wondering yeah. about the, the typology of the car yeah. that yeah. you would yeah. question, yeah. because it still looks like a car in some way designed differently. Yeah. And while the function of, yeah. or let's say the mechanics yeah. Yeah. of yeah. the devices have changed, yeah. the function yeah. is quite similar. Yeah. One, that it's a single function, and yeah. two, that it's still, I wonder about how you guys yeah. discuss this group, yeah. that the human body's intervention to yeah. operating the car should still remain, or should, if you yeah. do, let's say, dual functions, that the human body can be removed from the yeah. operation. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that raises one of the fundamental questions we talked about a lot. There are, I think, two very different philosophies. You, you, you can go in the direction of a highly automated vehicle that takes the sort of human um, operator out of the loop, if you like, as much as possible. And there's a huge amount of research on that kind of thing. We, we went in the opposite direction, actually, and this was a very carefully considered and much debated choice of saying that the, the bodily experience of traversing the city, whether it's mechanized or not, is a fundamentally important and interesting thing. And we wanted to sharpen that and, and, and uh, intensify that rather than reduce it. So the athlete car shows that dimension very, very clearly. It's all about bodily engagement and, and uh, so on. The other, the other sort of thing is the way, I didn't talk about it in this presentation, but um, of course we think of these devices, the, these automobiles, as being mobile network nodes mm -hmm. and um, we are constantly weaving you into the fabric of the city by supplying uh, whatever kind of information it is that you need um, at a particular time. So one of the things I didn't talk about was the elimination of the traditional dashboard. We don't like dashboards either. Dashboards seem like a really bad idea, so get rid of dashboards. You don't need most of that information um, anyhow. What you do need is navigational information and in information that contextualizes your presence in the city uh, and so on. So, so um, think of the dashboard being replaced by a uh, display device that is as simplest as, as mapping that also does more, more complicated things than that. And you begin to, uh, to, to, to get some sense of, of the way we, we think about this. Uh, th there's a limit, to just, just back on the point of uh, how much they look like automobiles. Um, <laughs> there, there are some very fundamental things um, about the human body um, in ca encased in some sort of mobile um, device. It's not just that they look like automobiles, they look like Roman carriages, they look like you know, um, thousands of years of, of wheeled vehicles. The, I think we've been pretty radical in some dimensions, but still wheeled vehicles carrying people are wheeled vehicles carrying people. So, so there are some very basic things about that that establish some typology. Now, one of the other dimensions, one of the other dimensions of debate in this is wheels versus legs, right? Because th there really are two ways of um, 
well, there are more, but, but, but uh, two fairly basic ways of organizing mechanized um, transportation, wheels or legs. Um, and they both work. I mean, there are legged robots that do all sorts of things. In fact, the lab just down, down the hall from me is, is doing legged robots, and we, we talk a lot back and forth. Really what it comes down to is um, wheels win when you have a lot of flat surfaces, and legs win when you don't have a lot of flat surfaces. Right? So when you have cities that have thousands of years of investment in putting down roads and making flat surfaces, <laughs> wheels are awfully good. If you have uncontrolled terrain, um, then legs are very good. So um, these are wheeled vehicles, so they look like you know, thousands of years of wheeled vehicles. But we could have made them look like camels, um, assuming a different, uh, you know, different kind of uh, urban infrastructure. And in fact, you probably some of you know this famous discussion about uh, cities in the Middle East. Some of them built around wheels, some of them built around legged, um, legged creatures. And they have very different urban forms, right, because the, the infrastructure needs to be needs to be different. Um, the ones that are built around legs uh, have, you know, little winding um, streets and uneven kind of paths and that sort of thing. And the ones that are built around wheels have lots of flat surfaces. So we've assumed in this that uh, an urban context of lots of flat surfaces. Bill, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Good. Yeah, because somebody in this crowd has watched those leg robots run yeah. around and yeah. yell out. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's the thing. Flat surfaces, we've evolved towards a solution. Yeah, great. flat surfaces, wheels win. Yeah, right. yeah. They're more efficient. That's why animals don't have yeah. wheels. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> that's great. You, you, last time you were here, you hinted at the work on the car just starting. You guys were talking about whether it was steering wheels or not, what the other interfaces would be. It's a yeah. fantastic yeah. year or two. Amazing. Yeah, it's, it's moved along. Quite yeah. amazing. It's an, I have an amazingly talented group working on yeah. this. They're really very, very good. Were you saying, was, was Festo involved with this? We've done a lot of work with Festo here. I did, yeah. We did prototypes with, you know, yeah. the robotics company. Yeah. Great company. Yeah, yeah great company. The yeah. people here yeah. are just spectacular. Yeah, th these articulated ones, um, you know, these yeah. guys depend on um, pneumatic, pneumatic muscles. Stuff. I mean, Festo's yeah. not the only people who do them, but, but they're, um, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, th this one we're building now, this, this, this little, this, 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 this little thing. Um, this is, it yeah. has festo muscles coming down. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, um, to give it the flex. Yeah, you've got it. It's yeah. funny, Axel yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. is someone that's come up with me recently. Yeah. I was going to bring yeah. him over at some point. Yeah, he's a good The work is great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I saw yeah. It, he, yeah. he was credited on several things yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. No, he's one of our... My team over he, in DRI.